Thank you, thank you. You guys all hear me? How about me? Wow, that's wow. He said no. The guy in the front row said no. We need some hearing aids, sir. Is that fine? Okay. We're good. All right, well, welcome. Welcome to Grab... What? That's loud for me. Welcome to GraphQL Microservices, how we learn to be big and small at the same time. Uh, I'm Seth Tippetts. I'm the innovation architect at Vivint Solar. And I'm Dan Cruz. I'm the platform architect also at Vivint Solar, as you can see. So before we talk specifically about GraphQL, uh, let me talk a little bit about how we got here, um, where APIs are coming from. Uh, so initially, we had ad hoc queries. Uh, ad hoc queries, you know, you need an endpoint, you need data, you build an endpoint, and it gives you all of the data that you want. Uh, on the plus side, you get all of the data that you want without any extra. Um, it's not very chatty because you make one call and it gives you everything. On the downside, if anybody else wants anything, you're either adding to that, and now you get a bunch of crap, uh, or uh, the, you're going to create a new endpoint, which means you're going to deal with a main as a nightmare. Uh, additionally, the schema is not very well defined, uh, and you really have to know all of the URLs to, to be able to find anything. So then we had SOAP. I don't hear any groans. You guys must be a lot of Java developers. There we go. Uh, so SOAP came in to solve some of those problems. Uh, there's a single endpoint, so it's rather discoverable. Uh, and it was super powerful. Uh, all the data was there. Uh, the downside is XML, which, uh, yeah. Uh, which means it's really hard to get data in and out, especially kind of in our world. Uh, so then you come, then comes rest. Uh, everything here is a noun and a verb. If you know what you want, you know where to find it, and you know how to manipulate that based off of the verbs that you've got. Uh, the plus here uh, is that it's super modular, so it's, it's relatively easy to maintain. Um, you're probably going to still be getting a lot of data that you didn't want, uh, which is, is one of the downsides here. Uh, and hypermedia comes in to fix that. Hypermedia is going to be a lot similar to the REST endpoint, but all of the data, instead of being there, it's all uh, URL to that, and you've just got to click and follow that. On the plus side, you're uh, getting a lot less of the data that you don't want. On the downside, when you do want it, you have to start making a whole bunch of extra calls. Uh, so that brings us to GraphQL. What is GraphQL? A question we get asked. It's an open source project by Facebook. Uh, it's a single endpoint like SOAP. Strongly typed, the schema is well defined. You get your input output validation generally taken care of when you're dealing with basic scalar types. Uh, it's protocol agnostic. You can basically use any protocol that can be used to transmit a string or, I mean, data at all, you know, HTTP, WebSockets, AMQP. Uh, it's a thin API layer. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. And it's lean. You get only the pieces you ask for. Your client asks specifically for this type of data, structured this way, and uh, you you don't have to do the heavy lifting on the server to grab a bunch of resources that your client doesn't give a crap about. Uh, it, answer, it answers their entire question. It's the one place that your client would go to get data. It's not making requests. It's not dealing with different authentication schemes going to a bunch of different places. Uh, it's discoverable. There's a, something called an introspection query uh, that returns pretty much all of the schema as it's defined on the server so that your client can make uh, validation decisions on the, on the client side. Uh, it also supports deprecation as a first class feature. So as your schema is changing and mutating, because every business it, it changes in, in, uh, over time, uh, your, your schema can change with it. And you can let your clients know that certain fields uh, aren't the way to do it anymore. Yeah, so before we get into it even further, uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, why you wouldn't want to use GraphQL. It's not for everything. Uh, we think that it's a sol solid solution for a lot of things. Uh, but even if your needs are similar to ours, you still might not need it. So rapid prototyping. Uh, rap rapid prototyping is when you really want to get something up quick. Uh, you're not really going to have time to dedicate to the schema design. Uh, GraphQL, you really want to, to put the time in and, and do your data correctly. Uh, additionally, when you're early on in a project, because you don't have that time, you're going to start introducing a lot of arguments. Uh, GraphQL, GraphQL has a way of deprecating properties, but not deprecating arguments, so that's going to be a problem later, and you're going to have to coordinate that. Uh, on the other hand, once you understand GraphQL and you're good at it, you're probably going to want to do it early on, uh, but it's probably not the best, the best suited for that. Uh, additionally, if your data is non-hierarchical, meaning you've got a completely flat data structure, uh, 
uh, that your boss can understand. Um, if that's true, then you probably don't need it. It's probably a little too heavy for you. Um, GraphQL really solves the problem of data relationships. Uh, so if, if you don't have any, you don't, you don't need it. Uh, if your business or your current business or your planned business uh, relies heavily on traditional caching methods like CDN caching, uh, GraphQL might not be a great choice. It's difficult to cache things per request because the, the, the contents uh, of those requests are so dynamic and uh, different for every user with different contexts. It doesn't really, it's not great for CDN level caching. Uh, just to give an example, I mean you can do caching on the client side behind your services too. Uh, Traditional caching, REST, make a request for an endpoint, uh, you make that same request, your browser or the CDN says, yeah, so well, we already have this, here you go. Uh, you change that, that item, it invalidates the request, you make another request, you, you go straight to the server. Uh, GraphQL, make a request to get some stuff, it's a post, uh, you get back that stuff. You make that same request, there's no way for you to cache that, kind of makes the same thing. Uh, you change some data, Obviously, same thing. And then here's where it gets interesting. You make that request, still can't cache it. So, uh, and there's a little, yeah. yeah. So, uh, if you're using microservices, GraphQL might not be the thing you want. And I know that's the name of our talk. You're thinking, well, of course we want to use microservices. Why else would you tell us not to do that? That's why we're here, right? It depends on what you're doing. If you're building an API for a single microservice, uh, it's probably going to be too much, too bulky. You're probably better off using REST or RPC or something similar. Um, GraphQL doesn't seem to work very well behind GraphQL. We've tried it. We thought like, oh, that'd be great. You know, microservice, microservice, microservice. Turtles all the way down isn't, uh, isn't a great way to go about GraphQL. That's right. Now, on the other hand, are you building an API that's built on microservices? Great. This is where we want GraphQL, and this is where GraphQL is really going to shine. Uh, your back end, you're going to be using something like RPC, something like REST. GraphQL fits really well as the front of that when you're dealing with a whole lot of microservices that are uh, all built on something a little bit more simple. That's pretty much it. Uh, obviously, as the presenter, I get to make a lot of these really hard statements like that. But the truth is, GraphQL is a really good solution for a lot of things. Uh, this doesn't mean that it's the right answer for everything that you're doing, um, and there are a lot of other use cases where um, it could be the wrong answer. Uh, so what we do think, though, is that at a high level, this is a good candidate for most other things that you might be doing. So let me show you what it looks like. So this is where mirroring up there is kind of a pain. Yeah, it's totally weird seeing my code in white. But uh, these are the types. Can you guys see that all right? Bigger. Bigger. <laughs> well, I did it anyway. Uh, so you'll see this is the type definition. Uh, I defined my query. These are the top level objects of pretty much anything that I can do going in. I've only got one query here, so I'm really only going to be able to do one thing. Uh, every, every type is either going to be a scalar, like a string, uh, or it's going to be some type that I've defined here. Uh, you'll see I've got, uh, let's see, is it this guy? Oh, that was the wrong one. Hard to see from down here. There we go. That's better. That's what I meant to show you. Uh, these are the types. Uh, everything here is uh, all, of the all of the defined types that aren't scalars. You'll see strings. Exclamation point just means it's required. It's never going to be null. Uh, here I've got some, I've got a deprecated argument or a deprecated property that uh, you're probably not going to see anywhere else in this demo. And you'll see here I've got an interface. Uh, it does support interfaces, unions, uh, allows you to kind of do classical, in classical type inheritance. Uh, four types. And then here's my query down here. Uh, that's the one thing that I'm going to be able to do. Generally, you're going to have queries, mutations, and subscriptions. Uh, subscriptions are a little bit more advanced. Queries are anything that you're looking up. Uh, mutations are anything that you want to change. So uh, that gives you this. And we'll probably make that a little bit bigger here. 
Uh, so as you'll see, I'm doing the one query. I'm doing a customer lookup, uh, which is the one thing that I'm able to do here. Uh, over here on the left is my terminal. Uh, you're gonna be able to see the calls that it's making in the background. Uh, here I'm building a view that is probably the welcome page, so I've called it that. Uh, here I'm, I need to know the customer's information and I may have a link to uh, call their sales rep, so I need to know that person's information as well. So over there on the left, you'll see the, the lookups that it does, and over here on the right, uh, you'll see the data that it actually returned. All right. Uh, so all of this data, all of these fields, man, it's really hard to see all the way up there. This would be a great time to have that mirrored down here. Uh, this is the documentation that the introspection query built uh, that Seth mentioned. And here you'll be able to see all the things uh, that I can do. It returns a customer object uh, with these fields on it. Here's the deprecated fields that you shouldn't be using. Uh, and anything in here uh, is an additional type that has the fields that are allowed. Uh, the description up here uh, will generally be populated, but I didn't put any descriptions because I didn't feel like it. All right, so over here on the left again, I'm gonna be making a new query. This is gonna be for a detailed view where I need to show a little bit more information. Uh, and I've got some fragments here for code that I don't wanna use over and over again. Those are something that you'll be storing either in raw files in a database somewhere or whatever, uh, but you're never really gonna be touching those. So you just wanna kinda of save those off for usability. So now I'm gonna be making the detailed lookup. And here I've pulled the entire customer information, all of their sites, which are all of the houses that they, they have for, for us that we care about. You've got two here, um, as well as the badge ID for the sales rep, because I wanted to show that on, on the page as well. Grab that guy, we're gonna want that later. So one of the other things that uh, uh, it can do here is you, the one thing that we've been doing rather is we've been looking up a single thing. Uh, now I want to build a view that has four customers listed. These are our top customers. We want to show their name, uh, their sales rep information. Uh, and over there again, you'll see the calls that it makes. Uh, and now we have that, that small bit of information for all of those customers. One of the things that GraphQL solves for us that uh, traditional uh, ways of doing this are gonna have a little bit of trouble with is circular dependencies. So I've made a call here that uh, is going to pull the entire, or pull this customer, their sales rep, that customer's, or that sales rep's customers, which this, this user is gonna be a member of, uh, those customers' sales rep, which is gonna be that sales rep, and that sales rep's customers, of which the user's gonna be a member of, and I'm gonna clear that terminal just so you can see. So this is a, a bit of information uh, based off of all of those calls. Uh, but it's a little bit too much to go through, so I've made it a little bit deeper, a little bit less information. I got one more call that has that customer and that user all the way down, or this, this has that, uh, that sales rep by state. So let's. Filter that just by that one, the, by California. Which is gonna have a little bit less information. So let's talk a little bit about resolvers just for a moment here. Uh, resolvers can be synchronous or asynchronous. Uh, asynchronous resolvers uh, are going to be like fetching a customer, which is I'm gonna do on the query. Uh, that's gonna return a promise. Um, and GraphQL will, will resolve that before moving forward. Synchronous resolvers, uh, like down here for the full name, uh, that's gonna be a calculated field based on something else. Uh, but I can query that uh, just as well. And uh, I just want to mention that you can define, at a high level, GraphQL really is 
uh, a function that tells every single field all the way down the tree what to, what to return. And you can define those for anything, but the default, if you don't define it, is just kind of the identity function of returning uh, whatever the field you're looking for on the source object, which is the first argument to a resolver function. That's right. Uh, so let's see, where is that? I've got one contact somewhere uh, right here. Uh, nope, not that one. There's an address right up here. So the postal code, uh, gen by default, it'll just return source.postal code, but our data is kind of munge. Uh, so a lot of times it'll come back as zip or maybe zip code, and we'd modify that here. Mouse. Okay, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the best practices of GraphQL um, and some of the things that we've, we've discovered. Uh, the first one is uh, dealing with auth. So authentication, don't do it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you want authentication, but you don't wanna do it in GraphQL. You're gonna wanna keep the login, registration stuff out of GraphQL, do that somewhere else, use Okta or Auth0 or whatever to do your authentication. Uh, you are gonna pass the, the context, which is the, or the, the viewer object, which is the, the concept of that user all the way through, but that's gonna be deserialized before GraphQL and handed off to the backend. Identity, you do again want to pass identity through. Uh, the deserialization should happen beforehand, but the the identity is going to be passed through all the way to the to the backing service. Authorizations, which is making the decision on who has access to this, should also not happen inside GraphQL. Uh, this is considered business logic, which we want to be completely separate, uh, and Seth's going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, but Authorization should either be handled inside the SDK, which is outside of Graph, but still part of the platform, uh, that's shared code, uh, or it'll be happening all the way back in the backing service. Yeah, so uh, GraphQL, it's good to keep it as a thin API layer. Uh, it's similar practice to using Express. You wanna keep the business logic of your code outside of a, of a middleware. You wanna have that somewhere else uh, in a controller. Uh, Basically, as a general rule of thumb, you want to be able to delete your GraphQL code uh, and move on to some new interface. If you, if you delete something and you lose business functionality, you're probably putting, you're mixing some concerns. You're doing it wrong, basically. Um, and this is a quote from one of the co-creators of GraphQL, just to prove that it's not an opinion we have. It's actually something that, that they believe in, which is... Do you want to sit there for a second so I can read it? You guys can read? Uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that we focus on is being protocol agnostic. One of the great benefits of GraphQL is that you're not really tied to a specific protocol. Uh, and as such, you can kind of paint yourself into a corner if you start using protocol specific extensions directly inside GraphQL code. Uh, an example is HTTP status codes. You're not going to want a big tree of things and have certain errors happen and have it be a 400 or 401. Even though those things are familiar, uh, it stops making as much sense when you're doing WebSockets or RabbitMQ or something. It's good to standardize on those codes, and we've actually decided to standardize on the, the word of the HTTP status code, so instead of 401, we return unauthorized, right? Uh, cookies and headers, things that are specific to HTTP, uh, you should totally use those things, but as a layer above it, kind of an abstraction that passes uh, just the things you need in the way that you need them into GraphQL's context. Uh, another example is the request object in Express. Generally not a great idea to just pass the request as the context, uh, even though that's the context of your request because now you're no longer able to do uh, you know, some future protocol that hasn't been invented yet, right? Yeah, so another best practice that uh, you're gonna wanna get the, get, get the hang on or hang of is data loaders. Uh, really this is anything that you're doing for uh, batching uh, or caching requests to the backend. Uh, you'll notice that request that we made that fetched rec recursion uh, was really chatty. Uh, even though I requested the same user, I kept requesting the same user. Data Loaders is a Facebook library that's another open source project that they've got um, that does all of the caching and batching for you. If you're talking to something like Redis, uh, it's going to roll up all of your requests to uh, any object by ID 
and you're going to say, make some batch request to Redis or Couch, something that, that is able to do that, that batching. Uh, additionally, if you're requesting an ID over and over again, Data Loader is going to prevent you from doing that. So all of the chattiness that we had before, it's going to prevent a lot of that. Uh, most of the caching, that it do, or the caching that it does by default is based off of the ID, but you can also pass queries to the backing, uh, the backing system uh, by using this cache key function, which given some object, it runs it through this function to determine whether or not that is a previously cached value. So the way that it does that, uh, just as a FYI, uh, is it pushes to process.nextTick for any of those requests, uh, and then it's got the context for everything, and then it just makes those. So you can call it with, a, it returns a promise every time you say load an ID and it'll resolve, if you call the same ID four times, it'll resolve all those promises at the same time, essentially. That's right. Uh, let's see if this will, how well this will work. Can zoom tech. All right. So here, I've turned on the data loader. Um, this is, I'm, I'm mocking out the concept of data loaders here, uh, but I do want to mention, generally speaking, the data loader cache is going to be per request. That's what they generally recommend. Uh, that means that here, where I'm going to be making multiple calls and caching those responses uh, via data loader, you're not actually going to want to do that. You're going to want to make one request, and within that request, cache all of the data Unless this was a purely public API and the data were static, in which case, I guess you could use a public, a public cache. Uh, you could also store your cache in Redis uh, through Data Loader. So here I'm going to make a call for that user. Uh, oh, there we go. Pulled up the user, uh, the customer, and the sales rep. And now, let me clear that. I make the call again, uh, and here uh, I've added the site, so it's, it's a, doing some additional lookup there. And let me grab the state. There we go. And here I'm going to do a lookup for I'll skip that one. Let's look up the user, the sales rep, uh, and all of their customers. Give that a second. And here is the call for the customer, uh, their sales rep, and that customer over and over again. And as you see, uh, if this were all in one request, data loader would have cached that, and it doesn't actually have to make any additional calls. Okay. Uh, this one's kind of a dumb slide for a Utah JS, but JSON's optional. You can serialize your data any way you choose. Obviously, most libraries are written to handle JSON, but if you really wanted to, you could have GraphQL return YAML or something dumb. So. <laughs> Somebody kick that guy out. <laughs> you said XML, I said something dumb. We're saying the same thing. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about monoliths. Uh, monoliths just means that all the code lives in the same place, right? Um, Seth asked me recently, uh, if I were starting a new GraphQL project, would I start with a monolith? And the real answer is that it depends on who's paying for hosting. Because if it's me, then yes, I just want one box. Uh, there's a lot of extra overhead. There's a lot of extra work to go into building this monolith or to building out a microservice architecture. Um, and initially, you don't really need that if you're building something new. Uh, if somebody else is paying for the hosting, then it's better to do it right the first time. But if this is a startup, I'm probably going to start small and then scale when that's the problem. One of the benefits here is, as I scale up to microservices, because it's all coming through that, those resolvers, like we talked about, then it's going to be a change from making a call to some SDK that's going to look in the database 
to making a call to a backing endpoint that's going to look in the database. You're not really locked in there. Uh, so GraphQL is really going to allow you to grow that uh, without having to, uh, to, to change the way that that interface looks or acts. So let me show you a little bit about how we're doing it. Uh, this, these are basically all of the consumers of our data. This is going to be any single page app, any mobile app, any third party service, whatever. Here's the platform. Uh, notice this doesn't say GraphQL. The platform is a little bit bigger than that. This is the gateway into our data. Uh, GraphQL here, notice it's a thin API. Uh, GraphQL is one of the interfaces into our data, but not the only one. If you're dealing with something like Salesforce, uh, then you're probably familiar with OData. You're probably going to have an OData interface here. If you're dealing with a bunch of uh, hardware devices, you may have an MQTT uh, interface here. But GraphQL is our preferred one for dealing with most clients. So these are the SDKs. This is the, where the business logic can start. Uh, like Seth said, if we delete GraphQL, the OData stuff still works, or the MQTT stuff still works. This is where all the business logic lives. If you're dealing with Express, same thing. You could delete Express, and you should still have the business logic here. So then we have the backing microservices. They're microservices, so they should do one thing and do it well. Uh, inside AWS, this could be running on Lambdas. This could be running on, uh, on Elastic Beanstalk. This could be running out of EC2. Uh, really, it's anything. This is where the majority of the business logic is going to happen. This is where most of your authorization decisions are going to happen. Uh, this is where you're going to decide what the, what the data is and who's allowed to see it. So these are the data stores. Uh, the service has access, access to the data store, so the data store isn't going to be making authorization decisions. Uh, the data store grants access to the service, and the service should make those decisions for you. The data store should be relatively dumb here. Now we're going to talk about some just general best practices along with microservices that really lend themselves well to working with GraphQL in that uh, environment. Uh, it's good to standardize your request and response between services. Doesn't really matter what it is, just pick a standard and stick to it. Uh, we started off with a custom standard and eventually moved to JSON just because it was a little simpler. Uh, like I mentioned before, you want to standardize on your response codes. Uh, I don't know if anyone gets that PHP joke at the end there. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sure someone does. <laughs> Poor that guy. <laughs> Here, I'll put it back up. Poor that so, guy's career. Just so that guy can be like, that's a, that's a double colon error in... Uh, yeah, okay, I'm out. <laughs> uh, fetchers, well, that's what we, we initially actually called them uh, innators from Perry and the Platypus. Uh, yeah. We got some people with kids, all right. Uh, <laughs> well, they were called innators, we called them fetchers, now we call them SDKs because we've eventually grown and now they don't just fetch, they also mutate. Uh, these are basically common reusable libraries that you can use to make requests between your microservices. Uh, they're part of the platform, not really part of the API. It, you should probably standardize on a common naming convention for your function signatures. Uh, Facebook recommends starting every single function with a viewer object so that it's uh, kind of deterministic in that way. Uh, and if you've used any major SDKs, you know that you're not just going to start adding numbers and putting exclamation marks. At, well, it's syntactically incorrect. But uh, we in initialize SDKs per request. We pass the viewer in every time we make a new instance, which is different than what Facebook says. Um, and the SDK can control business logic, uh, pretty much only if you're using uh, the consumers of those SDKs are opaque clients, kind of things that you trust. Um, better yet, the service, the backing service, like Dan mentioned, would have all the, the business decisions there so that you can kind of take this existing code for your SDKs and just if you decide you want to start integrating with third parties, you just hand it over and it works. Yep. So let me, well, let us talk a little bit about um, some of the specific benefits that we've dealt with um, at Vivint Solar as we've been moving to this GraphQL uh, API uh, in our platform. So Vivint Solar, not to be confused with Vivint Smart Home, uh, is the second company, and Vivint Smart Home was the first. And when you start that way, when you start with a company and move to two, 
the data kind of has to fit into the mold. At least that's the way that it's done initially. Um, that means that when you start separating, now you get to architect your data and you get to start thinking about the way that the data should be and then fixing that. Uh, what that means is you're going to have a lot of migration meetings. Has anybody here been to a data migration meeting? Yeah, so they're kind of a pain. Uh, data migration meetings is generally gonna be all hands on deck. Uh, they're going to change data in the back end and everybody including the front end dev has to be there to make sure that everything works the way that it's supposed to. Uh, with GraphQL, that allows us now to have discussions about what the data should be and really get there. For our mobile apps, we ask them what their questions are. What do they need and what should that data look like to build the entire view? And then we, through GraphQL resolvers, are able to fetch that wherever that lives. And then as the data is migrated to the correct place in the back end, the end customer, or the end, well for us our customers are the developer, so the end developer is not affected at that point. Uh, we may have to change our resolvers, but that's pretty much it. Some fields may get deprecated, but we polyfill that for now and help them move when they have time in their sprint. Which is nice. I mean, rolling a, for a server forward is a lot easier than telling all your sales reps they need to update the app when they don't know how to tie their shoes. I'm sure one of them can. Uh, we also had an instance where we, we had a web app that existed for a, for a certain functionality. The business decided they wanted an app. We set out with some goals. We wanted to build it in React Native. We're all JavaScript developers. Uh, and we wanted to use only GraphQL so we could really dog food that technology and ensure that our uh, client developers would enjoy that development workflow. Uh, we had started work on the platform six months prior, prior to starting this project. Um, and we just, out of luck, happened to have most of the data already uh, you know, put into the schema that we needed to build this app. It was a very simple app. It was read-only. Um, we used the Apollo client, uh, which is a GraphQL client. But the API really helped. Uh, it didn't, didn't hinder development at all, which is usually a problem when you deal with waterfall-type scenarios. Uh, overall, it took about two weeks to get uh, from a design to an alpha demo that we could start testing out with users, and I feel like it was largely due to the integration with GraphQL. Uh, and since then, we've started to add complexity, started to add mutations, some other interesting features to the, th uh, to the app, and because we've kept a close watch on schema design, which you kind of need to do when you're dealing with GraphQL, uh, those features have been easier to introduce than they might have been uh, using traditional REST or something else. So let's talk about some other things um, that you're really going to need to consider. Um, there's really one big one here, um, and it's metrics. Um, as you know, the architect, one of the things that I'm interested in is to find out how things are working and why. Um, there is a, uh, there's a product that Apollo offers. Uh, Apollo is the company that does most of the open source stuff uh, for GraphQL that Facebook doesn't. Uh, their paid service that they're introducing is Apollo Optics. Uh, it shows you over time how long it takes to make certain queries. Uh, it shows you which fields are taking the longest. That doesn't really show me why things are taking a long time. So we've had to, to manually go in and add some things to, uh, to add like a, a request ID that I can track all the way down and find out why things are taking a long time or find out which service as part of this, this backing system uh, is really taking the time. So this is one of those things that you're probably going to want to do if you want to really have insight into your system. Uh, so something like New Relic, Logly, uh, Elasticsearch, um, Splunk, somewhere to put your data that you can you know, learn these things as you need to. I do expect that this is going to get better over time or that somebody else is gonna come in and and play ball with that. But in the meantime, that's, that's definitely something that you're gonna have to, to, to do yourself to do right. Uh, JavaScript conference, obviously we wanna talk a little bit about client implementation. Facebook's official uh, GraphQL client's called Relay. They recently came out with Relay Modern, which simplified the API a lot. Um, I've been told there's a big learning curve. We haven't used Relay too extensively at Vivint Solar. 
uh, Apollo, like Dan mentioned, they have an Apollo client. Uh, the difference between these two is Relay kind of gives you a fragment that you t tell a specific component what my data requirements are, and then it kind of magics it. Uh, Apollo is more like give me the whole query, maybe for this page, and it'll it'll do some caching for you there. Uh, and alternatively, you can use nothing. You can use Axios or some just a random request library because you're not really locked in. It's just a you get a string and it returns whatever you want to return. Uh, a little bit about the future of GraphQL. There's a lot of exciting developments going on. They're actively adding some features to the spec. Uh, Dan mentioned sub subscriptions are out, so if you want to do real-time uh, updates with your data, you can have your client subscribe to a certain change, and it'll, it'll push that down via WebSocket or whatever. Uh, some of the newer things, batch defer, uh, those let you, you might have seen one of the weak points of GraphQL is that uh, as you make a query, if you make a really big query, it's gonna return as, as your slowest common denominator, right? Whichever, if you're making a request to Salesforce that takes eight seconds, or you're making a request to Mongo that takes 0.5 milliseconds, it's gonna be eight seconds, right? Uh, so defer kind of lets you say from a client, or when you're defining your schema, this is gonna take longer. And then uh, you can return the, the quick stuff quick and, and send back a, a, the follow-up response later. So I've got this conclusion slide, but we're out of time, so hopefully you remember all the things that I said right before this. Thank you.